going to be reading chapters 17 through 19. The first vocab is obligation. An obligation is something a person has to do but doesn't necessarily want to do. Scrupulous means a person has scruples. Scruples are rules a person has, like personal rules. Exactitude means exactness. Hasten means hurry. Commission is a fee a salesperson is paid or a bank is paid for their services. Assent means agreement. In this context, dissent means disagreement. In this context, former means the first mentioned. Latter means the last mentioned. And this is usually in the same sentence or in a sentence immediately following what it's referencing. Punctuality is being on time. Providence is another word for God. A dowry is a fee almost uh, that a bride's family would pay the groom. And this was required at the time. A benefactor is a person who benefits someone else who pays for something for them. Cochineal is red pigment used to dye clothing that was made from the shells of a very specific bug. Indigo is a bluish purple dye that is used to dye clothing made from a flower. Things to know before reading. Bankruptcy is far more significant during this time period than it is now. Also during this period, a dowry was expected in most marriages. If you didn't have one, you couldn't get married. Sometimes one credit company will buy the debts of another. And they usually do this to collect those debts and add fees to it and get some kind of return. Sinbad the Sailor is a fictional character from Arabian Nights, a text also featuring Aladdin. And during this period, suicide was a means of escaping dishonor. It wasn't done as a result of uh, depression or anything. It was something done uh, to save a person's name. Chapter 17. The day following the scene at Caderousse's Inn, a man in his early 30s with both the appearance and accent of an Englishman presented himself before the mayor of Marseille. Monsieur, he said, I am the head clerk of the firm of Thompson and French of Rome. For the past 10 years, we have been dealing with the firm of Morel and Son here in Marseille. Our dealings with them now involve approximately 100,000 francs, and we are somewhat uneasy about this money, for we have heard reports that the firm is threatened with bankruptcy. I have come from Rome expressly to ask you for information on this matter. Monsieur, replied the mayor, I know that Monsieur Morel has been dogged by misfortune for the last four or five years, but although I myself am his creditor to the extent of 10,000 francs, I am not in a position to give you any information on the state of his finances. If you ask me my personal opinion of Monsieur Morel, I will tell you that he is an extremely honest man who has so far met all his obligations with scrupulous exactitude. But that's all I can tell you. If you wish to know more, I suggest that you see Monsieur de Beauvis, the inspector of prisons. I believe he has 200,000 francs invested in the firm. Since his investment is much greater than mine, if there really is anything to fear, you will no doubt find him better informed than I am. The Englishman took leave of the mayor, and with that gait peculiar to the sons of Great Britain, went off to see the inspector of prisons. Monsieur de Beauvais was in his office. The Englishman asked him the same questions he had just asked the mayor. Oh, Monsieur de Beauvais. Oh, cried Monsieur de Beauvais. Your fears are unfortunately very well grounded, and you see a desperate man before you. I have 200,000 francs invested in Monsieur Morel's firm. That money was to be my daughter's dowry, and we intended to have the wedding two weeks from now. I was to receive 100,000 francs on the 15th of this month and another 100,000 on the 15th of next month. Then, less than half an hour ago, Monsieur de... Monsieur Morel came here to see me and told me that if his ship, the Ferron, hasn't arrived by the 15th, it will be impossible for him to make his payment to me. I'm afraid it looks like bankruptcy. You're quite worried about your investment, then. I consider it as good as lost. Very well. I'll buy it from you. At an enormous discount, I suppose. No. 
for 200,000 francs. Our firm doesn't do business that way. And how would you pay? Cash. The Englishman took out a roll of banknotes, which contained at least twice as much as the amount of Monsieur de Beauvais' investment. A flash of joy passed over the latter's face, but he made an effort to control himself and said, I must warn you that in all probability, you'll receive less than 6% of that sum. That doesn't concern me, replied the Englishman. It concerns the firm of Thompson and French, in whose name I am acting. It may be that they wish to hasten the ruin of a rival firm. All I know is that I'm prepared to pay you the sum if you will sign a deed of assignment, but I must ask you for a commission. Why, that's only fair, cried Monsieur de Beauvais. The commission is usually one and a half. Do you want two, three, five, more than that? Monsieur, said the Englishman laughing. I am like my firm. I don't do business like that. No, my commission is quite different. Tell me then, you're the inspector of prisons, aren't you? Yes, and you keep a register with notes concerning each prisoner. Yes, there is a record of each prisoner. Good. I was raised in Rome by a poor priest who suddenly disappeared one day. I later learned he had been imprisoned in the Chateau d'Eve, and I'd like to learn the details of his death. What was his name? The Abbe Ferrier. Oh, I remember him quite well, said Monsieur de Beauvais. He was mad. He claimed to know the location of an immense fortune and offered fantastic sums to the government in exchange for his freedom. He died five or six months ago last February. I remember the date because the poor fellow's death was accompanied by a very peculiar circumstance. Might I know what that circumstance was? Asked the Englishman. Well, Ferrier's cell was about 50 feet away from that of a former Bonapartist agent, one of those who contributed most to the usurper's return in 1815. A very dangerous man. I saw him in his cell in 1816 or 1817, and he made a very deep impression on me. I'll never forget his face. The Englishman smiled almost imperceptibly. It seems that Dante's... Was that the dangerous Bonapartist name? Asked the Englishman. Yes, Edmond Dantes. It seems that Dantes had either procured some tools or made them, for an underground passage was found between the cells of the two prisoners. I suppose the passage was made for the purpose of escaping. Precisely. But unfortunately, Ferrier was seized with a cataleptic fit and died. Dantes, however, still saw a way to escape, thinking, no doubt, that prisoners who died in the Chateau d'If were buried in an ordinary cemetery. He carried Ferrier's body into his own cell, placed himself in the sack in which the body had been sewn up, and waited for the burial. But the Chateau d'If has no cemetery. The bodies of dead prisoners are simply thrown into the sea with a cannonball tied to their feet. You can imagine Dante's surprise when he felt himself thrown from the top of the cliff. I wish I could have seen his face. That would have been difficult, remarked the Englishman. No matter said Monsieur de Beauvais, who was in a very good humor now that he was assured of recovering his 200,000 francs. I can imagine what it looked like. He burst out laughing. So can I, said the Englishman, who also began to laugh, but in the reserved manner peculiar to the English. Then he said, so the fugitive was drowned, was he? He certainly was. Very well. Now let's come back to the registers. Oh yes, excuse me. My story led me away from the subject. Come into my office and I'll show you the records. They both went into Monsieur de Beauvais' office. Everything was in perfect order. The Englishman sat down in an armchair, and the inspector brought him the register and the folder concerning the Chateau d'If, inviting him to look through them as long as he liked, while he himself sat down in a quarter and read a newspaper. The Englishman quickly found the records relating to Abbe Feria, but the story told to him by Monsieur de Beauvais had apparently interested him greatly, for after perusing these documents, he continued to leaf through the records until he came to those concerning Edmond Dantes. Everything was there. The letter of denunciation, the examination, Morel's petition, and Villefort's recommendations. He quietly folded the letter of denunciation and put it in his pocket. Then he read the examination, noted that the name of Nortier was mentioned nowhere in it, and looked over Morel's petition dated April 10, 1815, in which, since Napoleon was in power at that time, he exaggerated the services Dantes had rendered to the imperial cause. He now understood everything. During the Second Restoration, that petition had become a terrible weapon in Villefort's hands. He was therefore not surprised when he saw the following words besides Dante's name in the register. Edmond Dante's ardent Bonapartist took active part in return from Elba to be kept in solitary confinement and under careful watch. He compared these notes with the certificate attached to Morel's petition and saw that the handwriting was the same. They had both been written by Villefort. Thank you said the Englishman, closing the register. I've read everything I need, and now it's my turn to keep the promise. I make 
make out the deed of assignment and I'll give you the money. Monsieur de Beauvais hurriedly drew up the document while the Englishman counted out the banknotes. 18. Anyone who had left Marseille a few years before, knowing the firm of Morel and Son, and then returned at the period of our story, would have found it greatly changed. Instead of that atmosphere of animation and well-being which radiates from a prosperous house, instead of the busy clerks hurrying through the corridors, instead of the courtyard filled with bales of merchandise and ringing with the shouts and laughter of the porters, what would have struck him immediately would have been the feeling of sadness and inertia. Of the numerous employees who had formerly peopled the offices, only two now remained. One was a young man of 23 or 24 named Emmanuel Herbeau, who was in love with Monsieur Morel's daughter and had stayed on with the firm despite all his family's efforts to make him resign. The other was an old one-eyed cashier named Coplays, a good, patient, and devoted man, but absolutely inflexible when it came to arithmetic on which he would have stood his ground against the whole world, even against Monsieur Morel if necessary. He had been with the firm for 20 years and saw no reason to alter his faith in it now. Payments due at the end of the previous month had been made promptly and in full. But since that victorious end of the month, Monsieur Morel had spent many cruel hours. He had had to unite all of his resources in order to make those payments fearing that word of his distress might leak out in Marseille if he were seen taking such extreme measures, he took a trip to the fair at Beaucaire to sell some of his wife's jewelry and part of their silverware. Thanks to this sacrifice, he had saved the honor of his firm, but his funds were now exhausted. The return of the Ferrand was his only hope of being able to meet the payment of 100,000 francs due to Monsieur de Beauvais on the 15th of that month and other payments totaling 300,000 francs due on the 15th of the following month. But another ship, which had left Calcutta at the same time as the Ferran, had arrived in Marseille two weeks ago, and there was still no news of the Ferran. Such was the state of affairs when the representative of the firm of Thompson and French called on Monsieur Morel. He was received by Emmanuel, who instructed Coquelace to take him to Monsieur Morel's office. On the staircase, they met a beautiful young girl, of 16 or 17, who looked at the stranger with anxiety. Monsieur Morel is in his office, isn't he, Mademoiselle Julie? Asked the cashier. Yes, I think so, said the girl hesitantly. See if my father is in first, Coquelace, then announce this gentleman. It would be useless to announce me, Mademoiselle, said the Englishman. Monsieur Morel doesn't know my name. I'm the head clerk of Thompson & French, a firm which does business with your fathers. The girl turned pale and continued on her way down the stairs while Coquelace and the stranger continued to go up. She entered Emmanuel's office as Coquelace, using a key which he alone possessed, opened a door on the third floor, led the stranger into an antechamber, went through a second door, and closed it behind him, then came back an instant later to tell the stranger he could enter. Monsieur Morel stood up and offered the stranger a seat. The worthy shipowner had changed greatly in 14 years. He was now 50, his hair had turned white, his forehead had become wrinkled with care, and his eyes, formerly so firm and decisive, had grown vague and irresolute. The Englishman looked at him with a curiosity that was obviously mingled with genuine interest. You know whom I represent, don't you? He asked. My cashier tells me that you're the head clerk of Thompson and French. That's correct. My firm has a number of payments to make in France this month and next. Knowing your rigorous exactitude, they have obtained as many bills with your signature on them as possible have instructed me to collect the money from you as they fall due. Morel heaved a heavy sigh and passed his hand over his forehead. You have bills signed by me then, he asked. Yes, said the Englishman, taking out a bundle of papers. First of all, here's a deed of assignment for 200,000 francs made out to our firm by Monsieur de Beauvais. Do you acknowledge this debt to Monsieur de Beauvais? Yes, it's an investment he made in my firm at 4.5% nearly five years ago. Half of it's due on the 15th of this month and half on the 15th of next month. That's right. Then here are various bills due at the end of this month and totaling 32,500 francs. I acknowledge them, said Morel, flushing with shame at the thought that he was perhaps about to be unable to honor his own signature for the first time in his life. Is that all? No. We also hold bills due at the end of next month. Their total is 55,000 francs. In all, we hold bills for 200 and 87,500 francs. 
It would be impossible to describe Monsieur Morel's suffering during this enumeration. 287,500 francs, he repeated mechanically. That's right, replied the Englishman. Now, he continued, after a moment of silence, I will not conceal from you, Monsieur Morel, that despite your reputation of perfect integrity, there is a persistent rumor in Marseille that you are not in a position to meet your obligations. Morel paled markedly at this almost brutal frankness. I took over this firm from my father, he said, after he himself had managed it for 35 years. In all that time, not a single bill signed by Morel and Son has ever been presented for payment without being honored. Yes, I know that, replied the Englishman, but as one man of honor to another, tell me frankly, will you pay these bills with the same exactitude? Such a frank question deserves a frank answer, said Morel. Yes, I'll pay them, as I hope. My ship arrives safely, for its arrival will restore the credit which my successive misfortunes have destroyed. But should the Faram, my last resource, fail to arrive, it's, it's cruel to say, but I'm afraid I'll be forced to suspend my payments. As I was coming here, said the Englishman, I saw a ship entering the harbor. I know, it, it was coming from India also, but it's not mine, said Morel. Then he added softly, this delay isn't natural. The Faron left Calcutta on the 5th of February. It ought to have been here a month ago. What's that? Asked the Englishman, listening intently. What's that noise? Oh, my God! exclaimed Morel. What can have happened now? There was a great bustle of footsteps on the stairs. The two men also heard a cry of distress. Morel stood up to go over to open the door, but his strength failed him, and he sank back into his chair. Then the noise stopped, but Morel still seemed to be expecting something. There were, shut mouth. The two men also heard a cry of distress. Morel stood up to go over to open the door, but his strength failed him and he sank back into his chair. Then the noise stopped, but Morel seemed to be expecting something. There was the sound of a key being turned in the lock of the outer door. There are only two people who have a key to that door. Coclays and Julie, murmured Morel. Just then, the second door opened and his daughter appeared, her cheeks bathed in tears. She threw herself in his arms and said, Oh, father, father, courage. The fraud has been lost, hasn't it? Asked Morel in a choked voice. The girl said nothing, but she nodded, pressing her head against her father's chest. And the crew, they were all saved by the ship that just came into port. Morel looked up with an expression of sublime resignation and gratitude. Thank you, dear God, he said. At least you've struck no one but me. At this moment, Madame Morel came in sobbing, followed by Emmanuel. Behind them in the antechamber were seven or eight half-naked sailors. The Englishman started when he saw these men and took a step toward them, but then he restrained himself and withdrew to the furthest corner of the room. How did it happen? asked Morel. Come in, Penelon, said Emmanuel, and tell us about it. An old suntan sailor stepped forward, holding a battered hat in his hands. Hello, Monsieur Morel, he said, as though he had just left Marseille only the day before. Hello, my friend, said the ship owner, who could not help smiling despite his tears. Where's the captain? He's sick, Monsieur Morel, and he stayed at Palma, but God willing, he'll be here in a few days as healthy as I am. That's good. Now, Penelon, tell me about it. Penelon rolled his quid of tobacco from his right cheek to his left, wiped his lips, turned around, and shot a long jet of blackish saliva into the antechamber. Then he took a step forward and began. Well, sir, we were somewhere between Cape Blanc and Cape Boyador, sailing along with a good south southwesterly breeze when Captain Gamard came up to me and said, I forgot to tell you I was at the helm, and said, Penelon, what do you think of those clouds coming up over the horizon over there? I just happened to be looking at them myself right then. I'll tell you what I think of them, Captain, I said. I think they're coming up a little faster than they have a right to, and I think they're too dark for clouds that aren't up to something they shouldn't be. I think you're right, said the Captain. We're in for a gale. A gale, I said. Anyone who buys what's happening over there for a gale will make a nice profit on his money. That's an out-and-out -out hurricane, or I've never seen one. You could see the wind coming up the way you can see the dust at Montredon. Well, after we'd been tossed around for 12 hours straight, dip sprang a leak. Penelon, said the captain, I think we're sinking. I'll take the helm. You go below and take a look at the hold. When I got below, I saw that there were already three feet of water in the hold. I ran back up topside yelling, man the pumps, man the pumps. It was already too late. We went to work, but it seemed as if the more we pumped out, the more there was. After four hours of work, I said, since she's going to sink anyway, we might as well just let her sink. You can only die once. 
Is that how you set an example, Penelon? said the captain. Just wait a minute. He went to get a pair of pistols from his cabin. I'll blow out the brains of the first man who leaves the pumps, he said. Well, nothing makes a man braver than a good reason like that. Then, too, the wind had died down a little by then, but the water was still coming in. Not much, about two inches an hour. Two inches an hour seems like nothing, but in 12 hours, it makes 24 inches, which is two feet. Two feet plus three we already had made five feet. Now, when a ship is... Now, when a ship has five feet of water in her belly, she's no good to anyone. All right, men, said the captain. That's enough. We've done everything we could to save the ship. Now let's save ourselves. To the boat, men, as fast as you can. We love the Ferran, Monsieur Morel, but no matter how much a sailor loves a ship, he loves his own hide even more. We didn't argue with the captain when he told us to get to the boat, especially when the ship seemed to be groaning and saying to us, hurry up, leave, leave. He wasn't lying, poor Farron, because we could actually feel her sinking under us. We had the boat in the sea in less time than it takes to tell with all eight of us inside of it. We weren't any too soon either. Right after I jumped onto the boat, the deck burst with a noise like the broadside of a man of war. Ten minutes later, her bow plunged downward then she began to turn around like a dog chasing her tail, and then no more for on. As for us, we went for three days without eating or drinking, and we were already talking about drawing straws to see which one of us would feed the others. Ron picked us up and took us back to Marseille. And that's exactly how it happened, Monsieur Morel, on my word of honor as a sailor. Isn't that right, men? There was a general murmur of assent. You did well, my friends, said Monsieur Morel. You're all fine men, and I knew in advance that I'd have nothing to blame but my own bad luck. It's the will of God, not the fault of men. Now, how much pay do I owe you? Oh, let's not talk about that, Monsieur Morel. I insist on talking about it, said the ship owner with a sad smile. Well, we've got three months' pay coming, said Penelon. Cocles, give 200 francs to each one of these brave men. In other times, I'd have added and give each two men, each man 200 extra. But these are unfortunate times for me, my friends, and the little money I have left no longer belongs to me, so please excuse me and... Don't think any less of me because of it. Now take your money, and if you find another ship, sign on board. You're free now. The last part of his sentence produced a strong effect on the worthy sailors. They looked at one another in bewilderment. Penelon almost swallowed his quid of tobacco, but fortunately he put his hand to his throat in time. What? he exclaimed, choking. Are you discharging us, Monsieur Morel? Are you dissatisfied with us? No, 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 my friends, said Morel. I'm not at all dissatisfied with you. Quite the contrary. But what else can I do? I have no more ships, so I no longer need sailors. And I have no more money to build other ships with. Well, if you don't have any more money, don't pay us. We'll get along all right without it. Enough, enough, my friends, said Morel, choked with emotion. We'll see each other again someday, in happier times. Manuel, go with them and see that my wishes are carried out. He made a sign to Cocles, who walked out of the office. The sailors followed him and were in turn followed by Emmanuel. And now, said Morel to his wife and daughter, leave me for a moment. I must speak with this gentleman. He glanced toward the representative of Thompson and French, who had stood silently in his corner throughout the entire scene. The two women withdrew, leaving the two men alone. Well, said Morel, sinking into his chair, you saw and heard everything. There's nothing more I can tell you. I saw, said the Englishman, that you have just been the victim of a new disaster, which was as undeserved as the others. And this has confirmed me in my desire to be helpful to you. I'm one of your principal creditors, am I not? You at least hold the bills which fall due in the shortest time. Would you like me to postpone the date of payment? A postponement would save my honor and therefore my life. How long would you like? Morel hesitated. Two months, he said. Very well, then. I'll give you three. But do you think you're firm? Well, don't worry. I take full responsibility. Today is the 5th of June. Renew these bills for the 5th of September. I'll be here at 11 o'clock in the morning. The clock had just struck 11 on the 5th of September. The new bills were made out, the old ones torn up, and the poor ship owner had at least three more months in which to assemble his last resources. The Englishman received Morel's thanks with his usual reserve, then bade him goodbye. On the stairs, he met Julie. She pretended to be going down, but in reality, she had been waiting for him. Oh, monster! She began clasping her hands. Mademoiselle, said the stranger, you will receive a letter signed Sinbad the Sailor. Do exactly what that letter tells you to do, no matter how strange it may appear to you. Very well. Do you promise to do what the letter says? I swear it. Good. Farewell, mademoiselle. Continue to be the good and upright girl you are now, and I'm sure God will reward you. 
by giving you Emmanuel as your husband. Julie uttered a little cry and turned as red as a cherry. The stranger continued on his way. In the courtyard, she met Penelon, who had a roll of banknotes in each hand and seemed unable to decide whether to keep them. Come with me, my friend, said the Englishman. I want to talk to you. Chapter 19. The postponement so unexpectedly granted by the representative of Thompson and French seemed to Monsieur Morel like one of those returns of good fortune which announced to a man that fate has at last grown weary of attacking him. The only way in which Monsieur Morel could explain the conduct of Thompson and French to himself was on the supposition that they had adopted this line of reasoning. It is better to uphold a man who owes us nearly 300,000 francs and receive the money three months late rather than to hasten his bankruptcy and recover only six to eight percent of our debt. Unfortunately, however, Morel's other creditors did not follow this reasoning. Some of them, in fact, reached the opposite conclusion. Their bills were therefore presented for payment with scrupulous punctuality. It was only thanks to the postponement which the Englishman had granted him that Morel was able to pay them. Nothing more had been seen of the representative of Thompson and French. He had disappeared one or two days after his visit to Morel. As for the crew of the Ferran, they had apparently all found a place on some other ship, for they had also disappeared. <clears throat> for they had also disappeared. Monsieur Morel spent more than two months in unsuccessful efforts to renew his credit. On the 20th of August, it was learned that he had taken a seat in a coach leaving Marseille. This immediately gave rise to the supposition that his declaration of bankruptcy had been set for the end of the month and that he had left in advance in order to not be present on that painful occasion. But when the 31st of August arrived, Coclace paid every bill presented to him. This came as a great surprise to those who had been predicting Morel's ruin, but with the tenacity peculiar to prophets of disaster, they merely postponed the expected bankruptcy to the end of September. Monsieur Morel returned to Marseille on the 1st of September. His family had been waiting for him with great anxiety, for his ship to Paris was his last chance of salvation. He had thoughts of Danglars, who was now a millionaire, who still owed him a debt of gratitude for it was due to Morel's recommendation that he had obtained the position with the Spanish banker in whose service he had begun to amass his immense fortune. Danglars had unlimited credit and could therefore save Morel without taking a single franc from his own pocket. All he had to do was guarantee a loan and Morel was saved. Morel had been thinking of him for a long time, but there was a certain instinctive repugnance. Please stop moving your seat. But there are certain instinctive repugnances which are beyond one's control and Morel had put off approaching him as late as possible. And he was right, for he returned to Marseille, overcome by the humiliation of a refusal. He uttered no complaints or recriminations on his return, however. He kissed his wife and daughter, shook hands warmly with Emmanuel, shut himself in his office, and sent for Coclace. This time we're lost, said the two women to Emmanuel. Then after a short discussion, they decided that Julie would write to her brother, who was in garrison at Nîmes, asking him to come at once. Although he was only 22 years old, Maximilian Morel already had great influence over his father. He was a firm, upright young man who, when the time had come for him to choose his life's work, he had decided on a military career. He studied at the Ecole Polytechnique and graduated with a brilliant record. For the past year, he had been a lieutenant, and he now had good prospects of being promoted at an early date. Julie and her mother were not mistaken about the gravity of the situation. A short time after Morel went into his office with Coclays, Julie saw the latter come out, pale and trembling, with an expression of utter despair on his face. She tried to question him, but he continued to descend the stairs and would say nothing except, Oh, mademoiselle, what a terrible disaster. I never would have thought it possible. Emmanuel tried to reassure the two women, but he was not very convincing. He knew too much about the state of the firm's finances not to be keenly aware of the great catastrophe which threatened the Morel family. The next day, Monsieur Morel appeared quite calm and went to his office as usual. That evening after dinner, however, he took his daughter in his arms and pressed her to his breast for a long time. Julie later remarked to her mother that although he was outwardly calm, she had noticed that his heart was pounding violently. The two, <clears throat> the two following days went by in almost the same manner. On the evening of the 4th of September, Monsieur Morel asked his daughter to give him back the key to his office. She was startled by this request, which struck her as sinister. Why should her father ask her for that key, which she had always had, and which had been taken away from her in her child only childhood, in her childhood only as a punishment? What have I done wrong to make you take the key back? She asked. 
The simple question brought tears to Morel's eyes. Nothing, my child, he replied. I need it, that's all. Julie pretended to look for the key. I must have left it in my room, she said. She went out, but instead of going to her room, she went to consult Emmanuel. Don't give your father that key, said the young man. And if possible, stay with him every moment tomorrow morning. She tried to make him explain himself, but he would say nothing more. The next morning, Monsieur Morel was kinder to his wife and more affectionate to his daughter than he had ever been before. He looked lovingly at Julie and kissed her repeatedly. She remembered Emmanuel's instructions and tried to follow him when he left to go to his office, but he gently pushed her back and said, stay with your mother in such a way that she dared not disobey him. She remained standing in the same place after he had gone, motionless and silent. Then the door opened and she looked up with an exclamation of joy. Maximilian, she cried. At this cry, Madame Morel ran forward and threw herself into the arms of her son. What's happened? asked the young man, looking first at his mother and then at his sister. Your letter frightened me and I came as fast as I could. Julie, said Madame Morel, making a sign to her son, go tell your father that Maximilian has arrived. Julie rushed out of the room, but at the bottom of the staircase, she found a man holding a letter in his hand. You're Mademoiselle Julie Morel, aren't you? He said. With an appropriate. You're Mademoiselle Julie Morel, aren't you? You're Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle Julie Morel, aren't you? You're Mademoiselle Julie Morel, aren't you? He said with a pronounced Italian accent. Yes, I am, stammered Julie. But what do you want with me? I don't know you. Read this said the man, holding out the letter to her. Julie hesitated. Your father's salvation depends on it, said the messenger. She snatched the letter from his hands, tore it open, and read the following. Go immediately to 15 Ali de Mion. Ask the porter for the key to the room on the sixth floor. Enter that room. Take the red silk purse, which you will find on the mantelpiece, and bring this purse to your father. It is essential that he have it before 11 o'clock. You promised to obey me blindly. I now remind you of that promise. Sinbad the sailor. Julie raised her eyes from the letter with a cry of joy. She looked for the man who had brought it to her, but he had disappeared. Meanwhile, Madame Morel had told her son everything. The young man knew of the successive disasters which had struck his father, but he had not known how serious his situation really was. He stood dumbfounded for a moment, then suddenly turned and rushed up the stairs to his father's office. As he stood knocking vainly on the door, he saw his father coming from his bedroom, pressing to his side an object which he was trying to conceal beneath his coat. He cried out in surprise when he saw Maximilian, for he had not known of his arrival. Maximilian ran down the stairs and threw his arms around his father's neck. But then he stepped back abruptly and turned as pale as death. Father, he said, why are you carrying a pair of pistols under your coat? Maximilian, replied Morel, looking steadfastly at his son. You're a man now, a man of honor. Come with me. I'll tell you about it. The two men went up to the office. Morel laid the pistols on the one end of his desk and pointed to an open ledger. This ledger contained a precise summary of his situation. Read, he said. Maximilian read and examined. Silent. Maximilian read and remained silent for a moment, overcome with emotion. Have you exhausted all your resources? He finally said. All. In half an hour then, said Maximilian grimly, our name will be dishonored. Blood washes away dishonor. You're right, father, and I understand you, said Maximilian. He threw his arms around his father, and for an instant, those two noble hearts beat against each other. Now go to your mother and your sister, said Morel. Give me your blessing, father, said the young man, dropping to his knees. Morel took his son's head between his hands and said, yes, I bless you in the name of three generations of irreproachable men. Listen to what they say to you through my voice. Providence can rebuild the edifice which misfortune has destroyed. On seeing that I have died such a death, the most implacable men will take pity on you. Work, young man. Struggle zealously and courageously. Spend only what is necessary to keep yourself, your mother, and your sister alive. 
in order that you may repay my debts, in order that one day in this same office you will be able to say, my father died because he was unable to do what I am doing today, but he died calmly and peacefully because he knew I would do it. Oh, father, father, cried the young man. If only you could live. If I live, everything changes. I become only a man who did not honor his own word, who failed to meet his obligations. But if I die, my body will be that of an unfortunate but honorable man. If I live, you'll be ashamed to bear my name. If I die, you'll hold your head high and say, I'm the son of a man who killed himself because he, wasn't a, he was unable to keep his word for the first time in his life. The young man groaned, but appeared to be resigned. For the second time, conviction entered, not his heart, but his mind. Now for what, and now farewell, said Morel. I need to be alone. You'll find my will in my bedroom. Maximilian stood hesitantly for a moment, then pressed his father convulsively in his arms and rushed out of the room. After his son had gone, Morel put out his hand and pulled the bell cord. Cochlase appeared a moment later. My dear Cochlase, said Morel in a tone which would be impossible to describe. Stay in the antechamber. When the representative of Thompson and French arrives, announce him to me. Cochlase did not answer. He nodded, withdrew to the antechamber, sat down, and waited. Morel sank back into his chair and looked at the clock. He had only seven more minutes. His pistols were loaded. He picked up one of them, murmuring his daughter's name. Then he put it down again, took his pen, and wrote a few words of farewell to his daughter. He looked up at the clock again when he had finished. He now counted not by minutes, but by seconds. He picked up the pistol with his eyes fixed on the hands of the clock. He stared. He started. <clears throat> he started at the noise. He started at the noise he made when he cocked the weapon. Just then, he heard the door of his office open. He did not turn around when he heard Coakley's announce, the representative of the firm of Thompson and French. Morel moved the pistol toward his mouth. Suddenly, he heard a cry. It was his daughter's voice. He turned around and saw her. The pistol dropped from his hand. Father, father, she cried out of breath and wild with joy. Saved, you're saved. She held up a red silk purse. Look, look, she said. Morel took the purse, troubled by a vague feeling that he had seen it before. In one compartment of the purse was the bill for 287,500 francs. It was marked paid. In the other compartment was a diamond the size of a walnut with these words written on a small piece of parchment, Julie's dowry. Morel passed his hand over his forehead. He thought he must be dreaming. Just then the clock struck 11. Tell me my child, said Morel, where did you get this purse? In a house in the Alley de Mion, but it doesn't belong to you. Julie showed him the letter she had received that same morning. Monsieur Morel, cried a voice from the staircase. Then Emmanuel came in, his face beaming with joy and excitement. The Ferran, he cried, the Ferran. What about the Ferran? Are you mad, Emmanuel? You know she sank. The Ferran, she's coming into port. Morel's strength failed him and he fell back into his chair. His mind was completely unable to assimilate this series of unbelievable, unheard of, fabulous events. Maximilian rushed into the room. Father, he cried, why did you tell me the Ferran was lost? She's coming into port now. My friends, said Morel, if this is true, we must believe in a miracle. Let's go down to the port and God have mercy on us if the news is fake. If the news is false. They found Madame Morel waiting on the stairs. The poor woman had not dared come up to the office. A large crowd of people had gathered at the port. They made way for Morel, and every voice called out, The Ferran! The Ferran! And true enough, opposite the tower of St. John was a ship with the words Ferran, Morel and Son, Marseille, painted on her stern in white letters. She was an exact duplicate of the other Ferran and was laden like the other one with a cargo of cochineal and indigo. As she prepared to drop anchor, Captain Gomard stood on the deck shouting orders and Penelon waved to Monster Morel. As Morel and his son embraced each other amid the cheers of the entire crowd, a man whose face was half covered by a black beard stood watching the scene hidden from a sentry box. 
Be happy, noble heart, he murmured. God bless you for all you have done and will do. With a smile of satisfaction and happiness on his face, he left his hiding place, walked unannounced to the water's edge, and called out, Jacopo, Jacopo! A boat came alongside, received him, and took him out to a beautifully rigged yacht. He leaped on board with the agility of a sailor. From there, he took one last look at Monsieur Morel, who, weeping with joy, was shaking hands with everyone around him and looking vaguely for his unknown benefactor for whom he seemed to be searching in the sky. And now, said the man on the yacht, farewell to kindness, humanity, and gratitude. Farewell to all sentiments that gladden the heart. I have substituted myself for providence in rewarding the good. May the God of vengeance now yield me his place to punish the wicked. With these words, he made a signal, and the yacht put out to sea.